So welcome, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to introduce Chris McGee, who's a professor at MIT in the Mechanical Engineering Department. He's also with the Institute for Data Systems and Society and the co-director of the International Design Center at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Um, you know, I'm always excited to listen to Chris because I, there's an essential question for the world of what actually drives technological progress because, you know, technolo technologies cause problems. But they can also save us from things like global warming and we need to know which technologies to bet on and what the right strategies are. And I think most of the ways we've thought about that are not right. Chris is one of the people who I do think is thinking about the problem in the right way. I think the solutions lie in different places than where people have been looking for them. Um, you know, Chris is remarkable in that he's actually done it. He was, uh, had a, held a variety of positions at Ford Motors over a period of, what, two decades or something? Three decades? <laughs> uh, you know, so among other things, he was executive director of uh, programs in advanced engineering with global responsibilities for all major technically deep areas involved in Ford's product development organization. And, uh, and he's worked on a lot of things like making steel stronger so you can make cars lighter to get better mileage. He is also one of the pioneers of experimental work on high rate structural collapse aimed at vehicle crash worthiness. In other words, how, you know, crash dummies and doing experiments and simulations, developing a whole simulation environment to simulate how safe a car is. So he's literally saved lives. Um, so I think it would be much more interesting to listen to him than me, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Don. It would have been interesting to listen for another 10 minutes, but that, uh, I will get on with my talk. Uh, I have enough to fill 50 minutes, so we'll try not to go over that. Um, I'm going to share, my intent is to share a perspective about technological change I wonder if I can fake the mic up. Uh, that I've developed over a number of years of doing research, both with a fundamental and practical aim in, in the uh, area of technological change. And the fundamental work is really trying to get a very solid empirical and conceptual basis for what we understand about technological change, which, but also the practical side is partly just having that. If, unless you have that, you don't have reliability of what you think you do practically. And s the practical has been focused on reducing uncertainty, in particular, what's going to happen when. So that's the subtitle, you know, the sub. And my answer to this will be, perhaps not surprising, uh, that uh, we have developed a framework based on the knowledge that we see as quite useful and even at this stage, which is fairly early, and uh, reasonably reliable. So how will I arrive at that kind of answer? I'll be, be looking at five sub-questions. First, why even worry about the problem? And that will introduce this role of uncertainty. So what's known, though, fundamentally, particularly from the, pers prospect of, or the perspective of reducing uncertainty about what's going to happen when? And then when we have that, how can we turn that to something useful? Uh, what, what's it look like? And that'll be showing you a simple framework and some tools we developed along the way to be able to use uh, the approach. And then we'll show you some, I'll show you some cases uh, of, of using it. Uh, and I'll close by saying, okay, where do we go next? with this uh, attempt, I sometimes call it, to tame technology, or at least to partially understand it in a way that is more predictive. So turning then to the first question, why, uh, and I say scientifically or otherwise, why, why study it? Uh, the first reason is that technology is pervasive. It's literally just about everywhere, and, and technological change is also everywhere. And I show the well-known communication device uh, phone changes over the last decades, and, and I follow that with, say, something more mundane. I have these notes in my pocket, which I forgot to peel a lot until now, but they're written on paper, which is pretty mundane, no change, uh, except even those kinds of areas 
can have fairly large change over the last hundred years from just how you obtain the raw materials, let alone the way you process the pulp to paper, and, and uh, the difference in machinery. And if you go to a place like Finland, as I did last year, you see it's all pre-prepared for obtaining wood. What's that do for us? Well, it gives us probably an order of magnitude cheaper paper than back then, and which has some value, but some might argue that the cost may not be worth the value, but that's the kind of thing technology can do to you. Because it's one of the main drivers, the second reason for studying. Main drivers of human and non-human well-being with, with clear positive as well as negative aspects. Uh, it's widely acknowledged or widely agreed that it's the main driver of economic growth. You can say with all the good that gives us of life extension, more comfortable living, um, easier travel, more people, and other things that then add up to what's potentially negative in terms of some impact on the environment and some impacts of all kinds on people. For example, uh, another way you can look at the impact is to look at just a few books, recent books. And the first one, uh, Jean Twang, uh, is somebody that studies cohorts, and she's named our la the last generation, which she's uh, dating from bur born after 1995, the Internet generation, or iGen. And that book really documents a lot of survey work and a lot of detailed psychological work on looking at the way people in that generation differ, and particularly how they changed, how the people changed when the little screens became the dominant way we interact sometimes with each other. And there are real changes. People adapt to the technology. And it has good, again, and bad you know, consequences. And I think the adaption will continue. We'll continue to find ways to adapt to it as a society. But it has these backward-looking big effects. And, and there's books, a lot of books, on more forward-looking, potentially big effects. One of the ones I enjoyed reading was by uh, Max Tegmark, uh, on being human in a world of artificial intelligence. Very analytic look. You could say it was a follow-up on the Bostrom book from here, but he's an MIT guy, so it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and and it, it, it uh, is a, a kind of thing you start to wonder, though, when you read it, will this happen? And, and if it does, when? And what really will happen? Because there's not often care in all these books about what it is they're talking about, it's a little bit uh, looser. Take a, a fairly specific, uh, and this book's a good look at what driverless cars will do to change the world. And, and, uh, and there's some discussion of what that really means in the book, uh, what, what level of driverless cars, et cetera. But it also talks about the infrastructure changes, the city changes. There are large changes, but the thing that all these books, no matter how well they're written, don't usually do is really talk about when. They talk about when, but it, it gets really slippery and, uh, and it goes from soon to decades to other kinds of things. And it's that, that, that kind of problem that is what it, the focus today. Uh, a book like this, Radical Life Extension, uh, one way to define that is when people live as long as trees. Uh, and, and that's radical life extension. And, and there are people who are saying that'll occur. And the social implications of that, to my mind, are the biggest of any of the technologies being discussed, including artificial intelligence. It's, you know, if, if, if every year you live, you end up having a life expectancy, remaining life expectancy that's bigger than the one that you had the year before, it, that's the beginning of uh, radical life extension. When will that occur? Will it occur? When will it occur? That's kind of another big question that drove uh, some of this work that I've been doing. And there's many more books and so forth possible to read the list. The third reason for studying is that my perception, at least, is that our current overall approach to how we deal with this doesn't very well matched to the importance of the, to the society. And what do we do? Well, a lot of people, a lot of smart people think about it a lot and do 
and do uh, write some reasonable analyses. Uh, and those books show it. And you can see the very good people in governments, national, regional, local, work on the problem, try to, try to deal with technological change, try to maybe try to anticipate, but also try to get economic benefits, et cetera. And, and the, probably the biggest group of experts are more private investors or firms or, in, or venture capitalists or others that are really trying to get uh, very profitable positions in the next big technologies. And we all make career choices and advise our children or whatever with some sort of technological future in, in you know, techno some sort of future somewhat dictated by the technological change that we a reading in the newspaper will occur, or, or however we get that information. And, uh, and there is some monitoring of impacts, but mostly success, somebody who predicts one of these and it works out for some town or some region, uh, is it's celebrated, and the failure is usually attributed to irreducible uncertainty. How could have anybody known that bubble memory wouldn't continue, wouldn't dominate the information storage. Uh, how, how is it, po you know, how could anybody have known uh, whatever happened that they didn't expect? Uh, and I think part of the reason of this is that although the high level of expertise is very personal and subjective uh, and hard to assess, let alone reproduce, and, 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 and it's almost unfair to take somebody who is pretty well known in this area, Clayton Christensen, and, and go read what he said about the iPhone or other things, and you might find a fairly low success rate, but, but it might be higher than everybody else. So if you only do one subjective analysis, you aren't really, and, and, but the real problem to me is there's no defined tools, or very few defined tools really applied so that you can go and test them more generally and do a back casting and so forth, and, and become, and therefore be able to improve them. And I just close this little section by saying that technological change is too important, in my view, to be left at this level of practice. And, and I'll say it again, the focus today really is on initiation spread or what and when things will occur. So that introduces the topic, but then what is, what is known that might reduce, and this is a summarizing of what's known about technological change, again, particularly for the what, when question. And I'll give you some, what I see as very fundamental parts of technological change, but they're relevant to the question I'm trying to, this reduction in uncertainty. Uh, it's fundamentally, invention is actually the core of much of technological change, and it's fundamentally a recombination of existing technical ideas. Uh, and that's, Again, been, been uh, one of the mechanisms that the, that the cognitive scientists have come up for this combinatorial uh, approach, com combinatorial result, a recursive combinatorial result. It's, it's called analogical transfer, where you take things from one area, you do something intelligent with them, but you use them as a, a big insight in another area. And there's two examples here on the page, both for the Wright brothers. Uh, and the first one, they're well known to have been bike mechanics. Uh, and one of the most important insights they had uh, was to look at what they knew about bikes. First of all, they got very interested in airplanes and started following it for years. They read all the stuff. They had their heroes. And many times their heroes would die in a, in a, in a one-person plane crash. There's even some of them on film. And it was very easy for them to see oh, this is a control problem. It isn't just power and lift, it's a control problem. Uh, you know, these things go and, and they don't have any way of turning them or operating them. And so they saw it as a control problem and they were the only ones that did that of all the smart people doing it. Another analogical transfer, and, and Wilbur, who was the better scientist of the brothers, uh, particularly studied birds for months, watched them fly, and discovered, you know, he may not have been the only one to discover, but he discovered, you know, they roll and they turn by twisting their wings. And, and of course, that was one of the things they started to do on the airplane. And you look at their early planes, it was a very important part of why they were able to control airplanes and 
No one else had up till that point. There's a, this is also an old idea. Many books, I like Bob Weisberg, he's a cognitive scientist, and he sees this analogical transfer as very active not only in invention, but also in science and in the arts. Uh, it's quite worthwhile reading. But there's older books really just looking at the invention side. Uh, Usher and Ogburn back almost 100 years ago, who, who looked at uh, mechanical inventions or social change and saw this as a, a combinatorial process. Sometimes they talked about ideas, but more often they also talked about hardware. And you have to be careful. Uh, it's ideas that's really the power of the combinatorial. And by the way, my, my email is on the first slide. I know this is on video. Uh, and if anybody wants, you know, more detail on some of these references or something, just send me an email. I'll, I'll respond eventually. Uh, so the second fundamental that I see is important uh, and important to what and when, but also just important is that what's called spillover, particularly spillover of ideas, a number of other kinds of spillover, is pervasive in technological process. So this combinatorial process doesn't just combine ideas from the area you're studying. Just as in the Wright brothers' case, they brought something from biking and other technology. And they essentially brought, they had a number of others, but these two I showed you. The other one is really a scientific finding. You know, the way birds fly is a biology finding. So they brought uh, one from science and one from technology, the ones I showed. But these kinds of, per, uh, of technology, technology, and technology science, science idea transitions are, are, are quite common, and this has been, as I said earlier, uh, I didn't say this earlier, but spillover also has been sent for 80 years or so. It's another one that Schumpeter basically had right, uh, that, that, that particularly on the science side, it was an important part of what nucleates uh, technological progress. And there's been many studies of spillover, and all of them have, none of them have, 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 have uh, tried to even dent it as, a, as an important part of the story. And just if you do a simple patent citation analysis for flow of knowledge, I brought 50% of the, of the citations in an average patent come from not even uh, other patents, not, not from technology. It comes from mostly science. Uh, these are called NPLs, or non-patent literature in the, in the patent citations. And there's a, a lot there to scientific papers, and there's a lot to textbooks, which I think of as old scientific papers that have been condensed into teaching form. But another, in, in the patent, if you study it, in other words, half of them come from outside of technology. For the other half, the ones that go to other patents, about 70 to 95% plus of them come from areas outside the individual technology. So if you sort of just add these together, 50 plus 87 to 95, you get Something like 85 to 97 plus uh, of the ideas appear to come from outside the area that's being, uh, being specifically followed. So those two are two. Uh, a third one that is, seems a little different than spillover, because spillover, the way it happens is you essentially have one giant component of the, of the citation network, uh, almost linking most of science, but almost all of technology, too, that isn't, uh, except for those patents that never get cited and don't cite anybody. But, but it's, it's really an interconnected. And so do we have just one technology? Well, no. Uh, we have distinct technologies. And it's also tempting to say, let's stay simple and talk about three technologies. I mean, I've been in many dean presentations over the last 20 years that, Say so most of what's going to happen and what we have to worry about are nano, bio, and info. Anybody ever heard those? Uh, so that trio, and if you look at that, you know, it does account for stuff that's going on. But then you ask, okay, well, robotic technology, I guess that's bio, uh, or is it, uh, you know, what, what those words mean and how you use them uh, means you aren't really making a prediction when you say that, or you're, you're making a generalization, but it's not not clearing up anything about the uncertainty that I'm trying to deal with. It's not near specific enough. To get specific enough, we need 
a lot more technologies than three or 10 or 20. I'll give you an idea how many, but let's first of all talk about how we believe you, we should distinguish among technologies. And they're sets of related artifacts, number one. They differ from each other in numerous ways, but the most important characteristics are what the technology, what these artifacts do, what they accomplish in the world, what they do for us, basically. And then the second element of a, of a good definition is to recognize the technologies that have different science bases are different. So these two distinguishing characteristics are where we start. And if you look at a couple of examples here, which I call technology one, technology two, but I've, this is magnetic information storage, and I'll carry these onto a few other slides. So well, this one that tells you information storage is what it does. It stores information, and it you know, does it using magnetic, informa magnetic science, basically, or the knowledge like that. Combustion engines is a little more tricky because it's, it's not that trickier because it's not named that way. If it were named that way, it would be called uh, uh, chemical mechanical energy transfer. Because what it, what it really is, it takes chemical energy and, and transforms it into mechanical energy. And the science it uses is all that chemical thermodynamics, including fluids and heat flow and the rest of it. So that's two, two specific examples. And I, I just quickly show here, you can go down deeper in these by recognizing that magnetic information storage can be done with disk drives or magnetic tape. Even on disk drives, there were lots of different materials, and then there were different heads. But we won't get down to that level. Uh, and it, in times, it, we do have to. But for today, I'm mostly going to stay up at this dog level, not get down to the English-type chocolate or any of those other uh, biological analogs there. Uh, but even at this level, from what we've done, we have 50-some domains that we've actually gotten patents for. And we know from the scale of that that there have to be hundreds, hundreds of domains at this level. Hundreds, how many hundreds? That's still in the future research. But uh, So that's how we define the technology then. A set of artifacts, filling a given function using a specific technical quality of knowledge. And following these distinctions, other important, it isn't just to be different. Why do, we, why do we differ? Well, because a very important characteristics differ, namely, what change you're likely to see. If you look at magnetic information storage, one of the domains I identified, and you look in 19, uh, 1950, early 50s, uh, a five megabit hard drive you know, was much bigger than a human being, and very hard to get it even in a large airplane. Uh, 25 years later, it was smaller than humans, like this kind of size, bread box, I guess. And it's much bigger. It's five times bigger and a lot smaller. And then in, in late in the century, uh, you know, you've got 350 megabytes like that. Now, uh, another 20 years later, I mean, 350 megabits no one would bother with. It would be a speck of dust or something. So it's you know, you're, you got your gigabit sticks and so forth. Well, if you look at the combustion engine, a domain is highly dependent on at least airplanes. You don't see that rate. You don't see that change. And if you look at quantitative performance, it probably changes by a factor of 10 over that 50 years, which is a lot, by the way. Uh, but it's nothing like the factor of something uh, close to, I figured it out today, a million about on the top. So, it, you know. It's 10 versus a million. That's, that's a big difference. So if we just take all these technologies, of course, I've given you ones that are very different. But, but the point is, you have to deal with distinct technologies. And probably several hundred is the minimum number that you, that you can do anything uh, with that's reliable. Third item, that, or fourth item, is simply that increase in usage is not the same as increase in performance. We have to keep the two of them separate in our minds for answering what and when. Uh, um, for example, over time, usage often increases slowly and then more rapidly and more rapidly and then bends back. And when it gets kind of saturated, it's not, in, not, not increasing at all and they come down. Whereas performance improvement uh, keeps at about constant percentage per year way beyond the diffusion process. You know, as far as we look at a most, most uh, technologies, they're still going up by constant percentage a year.
for, for very long times. And, and this is a rather important piece of what we're doing. And what I want to point out is this constant percentage per year is totally consistent with this fundamental recombination. Why? Well, you start with n ideas, and you use recombination among those to get n plus percent n. Your new base is now they can also recombine with all the other ones, so you're constantly increasing your base. So if all other things are equal, you expect a constant percentage improvement, not a constant amount of preferment, you know, or not a square of that, or not anything, just a constant percentage. That's what you simply, and, and frankly, that's what we see. Uh, even they see it at Oxford. No, uh, a very important paper that Doan and Francois published, this is just one curve they put in there. They didn't put a lot of curves, they put a lot of uh, hard tables. They had 50-some examples. And, and what, these are plotted now on a semi-log scale, Please don't let that bother you. You do semi-log because that'll be a straight line if it's a constant percentage per year. Uh, and, that's, and you can see then whether it's fitting that or not. In this case, solar PV uh, obviously didn't fit it. You know, it doesn't fit it all the time everywhere. And when you then do a projection, which they did a very careful job on, uh, you, know, you know, their zones of uncertainty are, are nicely defined. There's other, you know, lots of other data like this, and I just show some of ours, which now plots better is higher, uh, so it just inverts cost in many cases. But you've got, like, light-emitting diodes, lumens per dollar, that's the inversion of dollars per lumen. Uh, it increases at about 24% per year. And you can see, again, it isn't a perfect fit at all, but it's a good fit. You know, it, it, it's reasonably, but it's got a lot of noise around it. And 3D printing at 37%, and batteries at 7%, and optical telecom at 65%. So there's a variety. This is the other thing I'm trying to establish. And that variety is perhaps best seen in this slide, which is the 30 domains about which we actually have numbers, uh, uh, not just patents, as we do in another 25. But and, and it goes from about 1.5% for hybrid corn and 3% for motors up to that 65% I showed on the last slide for optical telecom. Now, this also has the same noise. I'm not going to show the noise estimate for each. But this shows two, two things. The noise is pretty large. In any case, plus or minus one sigma is, can be a pretty big piece. But the other thing is the uncertainty is proportional to the level, to the improvement. So if you're, you're improving at about 10% a year, the uncertainty goes from something like 7 to 15, whereas you're improving at 48, it goes from something like 30 to almost 70. Uh, and this kind of observation is in the data that we have, Chris Benson's thesis and other data we have, but it's also a key finding of uh, Don and Francois's paper that, that, the, that the uncertainty over their cases did follow this kind of a linear behavior. Uh, and whether we understand it or not could be debated. I won't worry about it. Uh, just go on to the next kind of thing. These improvement percentages, which uh, I'm going to be relying on going forward, obviously, differ between technologies, but not between metrics in a given technology. Here's our two cases that we've been following. Internal combustion engines, we have, uh, in that case, we had data from three different metrics. And, and, it, and it matters a little bit which one you pick, but within the noise I showed you, it doesn't really, you know, there's not really a distinction among those. And this is so close together, it's, it's silly because it isn't really that close. There's more noise. It just, it just demonstrates that these differences can be very large. As seen on that qualitative slide, this is sort of a quantitative uh, version of the same thing, but it shows that these percentages per year are reasonably fixed. Why this is is, is also, I mean, I, I think I understand it, or I can pretend to think I understand it, because to do a trade-off between a, you know, a volume and the kilograms of a product, I had a big product development job. But uh, it, it, it's a different kind of trade-off. You're trading parameters 
the fundamentals are, are much harder to move, and that's what's moving the technological change. That's, that's my explanation for this. It's not a, not a theory, but it, 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 uh, to me, at least, I'm not unhappy with that result. Uh, there are other things that could happen. But. Now, the final note on this summary now, this is a short summary of what I, I think we know to re about uh, technological change that can help us reduce uncertainty. More rapidly improving technologies eventually overtake slowly improving technologies. And, and my feeling is, how can we now put a framework together, a simple framework that uses this uh, knowledge? And the first thing is, is what we're trying to do is sort of make that eventually a harder knowledge, not just a sort of word, uh, but to put it into quantification. And, and one way to do that, at least the way we do it, uh, is to look at just what we mean by a performance crossover. That means you've got some rapidly improving technology and something slower improving. And, and if they're measured the same way, you can find a place they would cross over. And, and, uh, and at the same time, there's a, uh, these uptake curves. I said we should keep them separate. But percent adoption has a very interesting period of time. This is where all the uh, destruction, the creative destruction that uh, Schumpeter talks about happens. This is where new firms are forming. Lots of alternative designs are uh, out there. Lots of action in the uh, in area. Uh, out here is, you know, this is where the big money is made, but, but, it's, but this is where the, the real action is and, and what you're trying to predict. And what our simple hypothesis, we call it, is that this crossover where you get about the same performance is where you should start to get significant improvement in the, in the uptake. Okay? It's, I'd say it's an intuitive theory, but it's, to me, reasonably clear. And this is from a paper that Chris Benson who's up here in the front, and I wrote this year, and it's in a working paper. Some editor didn't think it was for their journal. Anyhow, they, uh, uh, we haven't decided what to do with it, but, but I can send that to people, too. Uh, the, but this, then, is the, uh, this will allow us in to, from being able to predict crossover to predict uh, the really hot spot Bart for uptake, so it, it, it begins to say, begins to see an answer to me to what and when, uh, but it's not trivial. Then what what how, what do you have to do? Well, to get even the crossover, we need two things. That we're at any point in time, we need to know the essentially the current performance differential, and that that sure sounds easy, but we did enough cases to know that's the hard job. But we also know we need to have uh, performance improvement r rates or percent improvements per annual performance, annual improvements in performance. We need to have that for a number of technologies. I said hundreds, uh, and I told you we have data for 30. So that means application wouldn't be very good. And we took on finding tools and ways to be able to get these improvement rates without uh, measurement, because some of them will never be measured for a lot of reasons. And the two enablers, and they've been developed, really, I guess we started this about seven years ago, uh, fairly early in his thesis. Uh, and two were developed. First, we developed something we called the classification overlap method. That's a way we know a technology, we can go get the patents. And uh, he and I published a couple of papers on this. Uh, I guess the first one more than five years ago. And it, it's a work intensive, but still reliable technology. It's going to take us a long time to get all the technologies by it. So, uh, second, from known measurements, we had these 30 measurements. And we then you know, developed that method to get the patents around them. And then we tested different ways of finding estimates for the 30 we had. And, went, and, and we did some robustness tests and so forth. But, uh, but we, and we had a, 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 Chris and I published a paper also in 2015 on that. But we've gone beyond that in the group. 
and a, a re more recent paper, uh, also not published yet, under review, uh, takes these 30 domains that I talked about a few way ago, and it, you know, for magnetic information storage, I guess the data points didn't show up on this. Uh, it, we predict, this is the observed rate of improvement, this is the predicted. We predict a little lower on this case than we observe, whereas in combustion engines, I think we predict a bit higher than we observe. Uh, and oh, this is the observed, yeah, this is the predicted. So, but you can see that this, the 30 are, are kind of scattered around the line and not too bad considering the real, the real variation in the data. Uh, this is not a bad fit. Pearson coefficient near 0.8 and, you know, very low p-values when we do these things. But, uh, but that, that is that what that's what we'll use then going forward now because we can now go backwards and just get the set of patents for a technology, calculate and, and do just and then we'll just have predicted. We won't have any observed. And that's what we're doing for the many cases that I'll now show because we have now these set of tools, classification overlap and the prediction of the rates, and we have the framework with the crossover equaling the important takeoff. So we, we, we look at a number of cases, and the first thing I'll say, there's two things to observe. One, we've only been doing these for about 18 months. Uh, the oldest of these cases is about 18 months. And we're a small group, uh, and we, we've got a fair number of cases uh, already. And, and we cover quite a wide variety of technology already, from medical technology, genome editing, pharmaceuticals, 3D printing, battery electric vehicle timing, timekeeping, bubble memory storage, electricity versus steam power. First few are historical and the other ones are forecast. So this is backcasting versus forecasting. So let me start with the most recent backcasting one, the one that Chris and I used for the working paper where we show the technique. Uh, we used internet uh, takeover of distribution for audio and video. And this is the performance curves. These are actual measurements or reported measurements, not, a, not just a, a, an estimate or anything. These are actually reported measurements. So this graph's the same as that one. They're just plotted slightly different places because of the... And then this is the alternative technology. In this case, it was uh, mail delivery, and which was, you know, it was hardly changing. In this case, I think it was car pickup, but you can put in different alternatives and get different current. But, but the point is that, uh, that both of these occurred, this one should have occurred in the late 90s, and that's where we see the, the data. This is actual uptake data for audio transmission. Uh, it took off around that time. And you could put qualitative things on here like Napster Foundation, iTunes, and so forth. Uh, on video, video is a bit more, you need more, basically a higher performance out of the internet to be able to do it. And, and it's therefore about, you know, predicted to be about five years later and it, it shows up about five years later. So in, in very simple framework, this, this, show, this gives some support to, the, uh, to what, that it works. Uh, what we also learned is that um, what you're really doing when you, when you do this crossover especially when you do the vertical displacement at some point, you're actually thinking about a new product. You're, almost, you're developing a new product. You're thinking what customers want, how, what do you put in it. I think this was a single tune curve, but if you put an album, you know, things get a little different. And, and so you have to think of your product and specify it, which means the greatest uncertainty, when we did an uncertainty analysis as part of this, the greatest uncertainty was uh, that but, but you know, we, can get, we get pretty good at it, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's not going to be perfect because you might have the wrong uh, product in mind. But it's also used in a backcasting way, and I'm not going to show the data for this. Uh, electricity replaced steam in factories over a fairly long period in the early 20th century. And a lot of people wondered why it took so long. But we have good data that shows that the rate of improvement of electrical distribution was, 
like 10 and a half percent a year, and the rate of improvement of mechanical is like a half percent. So 10 percent a year difference means that over 30 years you get, uh, let's see, seven year doubling, about 15 to 20 times uh, difference over that period. So you could have some factories, and, and electrical distribution in, in some ways could simplify things. But if you walk into an old factory, old factories that had steam and mechanical distribution would put a big steam engine somewhere. Big steam engines are what you need to get decent efficiency. And they, you know, you'd run mechanical stuff up three floors. So these old factories were all multiple story. And once you had this unit drive, you put it on one store and get the good, good materials flow. But that took a whole different plant, a whole different layout. And depending on this, the industry and depending on what they were doing, that either paid off or didn't because it was a big investment. So it, it, it's just if you realize that these things are changing over time, it's not hard to understand this long time. Uh, bubble memory is a different kind of case that I particularly remember my friend from graduate school was working. And he, you know, bubble memory, I said, that's what the what the heck's that? You know, and it was pretty interesting technology that was, in his view and many others at the time, was going to take over all memory because it could serve as core and peripheral memory, had no moving parts, uh, and it's, it got some applications in the eighty, and then disappeared, uh, along with everybody that was working in it and research. You know, they went to new things, and and why? If you, at least the way I read it, I. I have a prediction if we went in and did this uh, calculation, we would find a fairly l low rate of improvement for that relative to uh, integrated uh, transistor memory or, or magnetic memory or optical memory. And that's, if you read Wikipedia, and it says, well, it didn't anticipate the big increases in the memory, but just didn't anticipate. They were already on that rate if you looked at the data. It could have been anticipated in my view, but it wasn't. And, uh, that's an interesting story. Timekeeping is another looking back, and I, and I show this because uh, it's really a series of, uh, over long times, a series of technologies really replacing each other with new science bases, but, but uh, one function, that is keeping time accurately. And this particular uh, axis is essentially how accurate it is, one over the time error each day, uh, also divided by the volume, because you can always make a bigger clock, like these early clock towers were much more accurate than the sundials, but they were so big, if you see the pictures of them, uh, they, they, you know, this room would have been a, an estimate. Uh, but then, you know, water clocks and big mechanical clocks, pendulum clocks had a fair amount of accuracy, but they were pretty big also. Uh, and, and then Harrison and Earnshaw, these people that essentially solved the latitude problem by getting enough accuracy in a, in a small clock that you could get out to sea and still have it accurate, but it was robust and lots of other stuff. Big technical, big societal impacts of these, but also accurate uh, watches, which I don't have good data on. Uh, and quartz just kind of ended all that and then cell phones ended even that. But, but we still, and I don't have the last couple data points on here because it ruins my pretty graph, but they're up in here. You keep watching the announcements and guess the size of the atomic clocks. They're less in room size and their, their accuracy is just off the charts. But who cares? Well, a few astronomers care, so it's still going up. The usage is, is I don't you know, I think pretty low. Uh, most of us just use a a cell phone to tie into a clock of that accuracy. We don't need to carry anything else. So most of us still have a watch. But. OK, another forecast. This is a, a harder going forecast now. Uh, and this is for battery electric vehicles, which is an important uh, transportation potential solution to transportation energy use and carbon. Uh, and, and, and what we do differently than anybody else, uh, we do a, a value index which compares uh, essentially battery-powered cars and electric cars with the key variable differences. Not most of the car will be the same with the two, but, but electric motors, uh, batteries, et cetera. 
And the difference is, the good news is that battery electric vehicles are improving more rapidly than uh, combustion uh, engine vehicles. Uh, and, and you see the relative value of a high performance. And by the way, high performance favors electric vehicles. They have very good low end torque and they go fast uh, for the same cost. The problem is the battery cost is still quite a bit low, but by 2035, 2050 for sure, uh, they, will, they will be superior to a comparable luxury high performance vehicle. Bad news is that uh, for a low cost vehicle, low, not, where performance is not as, as valuable to you, uh, and also cost matters a lot more. Even by 2050, even when we look at our uncertainty bands, which we do in the paper, uh, it's, it's probably not gonna make it by 2050. So it's not good news, but that seems to be what it says. That's the best projection we have. The other possibly good news is that by that point, by around 2035, something I've now been saying for a number of years, and. If I live long enough, you'll get to test it. it. Capacitors will be a better energy storage mechanism than batteries. And, and by that point, in other words, capacitor electric vehicles have a better chance by 2050 making it. Uh, I'm not saying they will, but they, they'll be a lot closer than battery electric vehicles. That I do believe. But anyhow, uh, that's a kind of projection that we're able to make in a, in a complex system. The reliability, we also, I haven't done it here, but we have in a lot of our papers done what's the probability distributions uh, and, and, and that lets you get a, a richer understanding but it, it gives you headaches unless you like looking at those graphs. Uh, we also, we did publish a paper in 3D printing subdomains. In this case, we went down deeper than just the 3D printing. We looked at all the subdomains which include SLA, uh, metallic, the layer, plastic layer, the uh, fusion deposition modeling. And, and, and we looked at, we got sets of patents for each of those subdomains, and we looked at our, uh, our normal graphs here, and, and, and this just shows that for the original one, our estimate and our experimental are closer together than they deserve to be, so don't believe, you know, you saw the whole graph, this one happens to be one of the predictions that really hits the data, uh, but you know we should be aware that all these are plus or minus big numbers. But let me simplify it by going to the one that is most important, I think, in a business sense, is the metal uh, SLS 3D printing. Uh, this is the SLA, uh, and that is still up in you know high 20s percentage improvement, which is pretty high. And, and there are people, a lot of companies and a lot of others are betting on metal 3D printing. It's a real process where you make real parts. And, and if, if, it, if, if this is the correct one, that's a very good bet. It, the closest thing we have that might be comparable is milling, and it's way down here. There's no, ch you know, there's no chance this isn't higher than that, which means if it isn't replacing it, it will uh, eventually. So it it's, it's sort of says if you're one of those investors and metallic 3D printing, you're probably in something that's, well, it's a good idea. You're going to have to beat your competitors or you'll still not succeed. But that's kind of a forward looking. Uh, another one that we've, we've done two, ca two cases in the medical technology. And the first one is, uh, can somebody else tell me what CRISPR is? I'll do it. But it's clustered, repeat, interspersed, short, palindromic repeats came out of uh, bacteria uh, for about 20 years of good fundamental work going on, wondering what these things were, and then figuring out they, they were gene modifiers. And, and, and somebody then said, well, we can bring it over into genome editing, plants, animals, humans. And it will be much more flexible, accurate. And it's, I don't know, if you follow that business, it's created quite a bit of excitement, patent fights, and all that kind of stuff. So the question we took, uh, what can we do to understand it? Partly because some sponsor wanted it studied. So anyhow, but we liked the problem, so we took it. And, uh, and we did two things. We did something here I haven't mentioned. When you get these patent sets, you can do a lot of other things besides calculate these percent improvements, like you can do what's called main pass. 
and this is the main path diagram. These are each patents and how they relate to each other in the patent network. But this is a set of patents that, if you look at all the patents, there's 1,500. This gets it down to 20-some, I think. And, and, and these are all the most persistent, the most important patents. And sure enough, there's qualitative work been done in genome editing, and, and this set of patents is known. They should have been here, and they were. It's called uh, zinc finger nucleases, and this stuff is also well known. And these uh, are tailin, which is another, don't want to get into it especially, but the point is you and these can see both who has the patents and what are the really important patents uh, in, the, in the citation network. But to go back to our basic story, what, what does it show about the rate of improvement? First of all, genome engineering patent set is, is currently only 3.6%. We don't have a good estimate for CRISPR yet. It might be as high as 9.5. We don't really know. This technique we used is not validated, but it's a, a way to try to get something. But in, in any case, what we conclude in this paper, but first of all, it doesn't say CRISPR isn't important, but it says if you're going to get a genome engineering solution, uh, if you think it's going to come in cancer before the end of this decade or something, I, I would slow up my, my expectations and say it's going to take, it's going to be stuff happening, there may be a lot happening in this area for quite a while, and, and yes, it, it, it could well pay off, uh, and, but, but there may be more excitement than short-term results are expected. That's my own uh, way of summarizing that. One, one more case, uh, electroceuticals. They're also known as bioelectronics. I would love to call them biostimulation, but the, but the bacteria people have, a, have used that term to mean something else. So what is it? It's stimulation of neural circuits uh, and doing this by, ex, by, by essentially electrical or magnetic or other energy sources. And it's got growing applications. There's devices going in the vagus nerve, which is the big nerve connecting the brain to the rest of the body. It's called vagus nerve simulation, stimulation. And it's being, it is the treatment now for epilepsy. It seems to be getting to be bigger and bigger in treating depression. And it seems to be getting emerging uh, activity in arthritis and many others. Brain stimulation, which is an external stimulation, seems to be, there's people talking about it and doing a lot of work with it in Parkinson's. But the biggest, earliest and biggest success is, you know, Four years old, or artificial cardiac pacemakers, which, you know, because of sinus node, no longer is able to conduct sodium properly to shoot the, get the heart to beat. It, it sends a, it sends something in there and makes the heart beat. So, um, and other thing is, it's, it's a very growing R and D investment. The National Institute of Health in the U.S. has, two years ago, put. 200 some million dollars to kind of try to do a pathway study for what is the neural circuit and where might you try to stimulate for different organs and so forth. And, and got, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, I guess the big pharmaceutical company here in the UK, has done a, a lot of, uh, at least publicity, they spent $55 million and they, 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 they put, ran contests and they've done stuff with universities. They seem to be very interested in it. Uh, if there's any GSK people here, I may hear. But, uh, but, but, that, but the question, I guess, is where, what are the rate estimates for these versus maybe, and I sh we use pharmaceutical technologies because we had some pharmaceutical patents we could go and get uh, improvement rates from it. And, and, and uh, is there much difference? And if there is, isn't, uh, maybe that investment but if there is, investment certainly looks like it's a good idea. So what did we get? Okay, this is what you close with, a very striking result. Um, we, you know, for all the different stimulation methods, these were different, uh, we, different domains, different sets of patents with very little overlap between the patents. And you see that the rates are quite different. The lowest is 12%, the highest is amazing 88%. I'm not sure that's going to compete with these. It's more surgery thing. But, but nonetheless, even the worst of these are, you know, the middle of them, the 40% or the uh, near 40% of these um, versus something that's 
these are essentially, and from a noise point of view, indistinguishable five or so percent. So if you take the difference and you run that, you know, in, in 20 years, this will, this will improve uh, like a million times more than these. Uh, so if they're close today, uh, it would say this should be a good bet. So if, if GlaxoSmithKline is not just lost patients because they haven't found anything or any other company that's doing it, uh, it might be a bad time to lose patients in that, that kind of technology. All right, let me just wrap up by what, will ha what should happen next. First of all, I've talked as if mostly everything exists and we just look at crossovers. Turns out that probably accounts for 80% of the de creative destruction. When you look at these, even these biostimulation or, you know, areas, uh, they started 15, 20 years ago. That's, you know, there's a, and more than that in some of them. Uh, and and, and if they, when they become important, it could be 40 years after they started that you can know about them. But it's not everything. You'd like to know when something new emerges, even if it's not going to be that useful at first. And can we do anything about that? We've done a study now because we, we have some patent sets, and these stars are at the first 20 patents in, this, in MRI, genome sequencing, 3D printing, uh, optical transport, optical information storage. The, the point is, this is also a, a probabilistic measure of how close to science. The, the average patent is way down here with its relation to science. Uh, so all these domains are a little higher and they're, they're related to science, but, but particularly these seeds seem to be particularly important infusions of science. So what our, what our thinking now is we're, we're going to be able to predict new domain emergence, but to do that we may have to go back and look at the, pat, the uh, publication citation network and see what's going on leading perhaps to these patent, these publications that get cited. We have a, I have a lot of hope for that work. We're also doing, as uh, Doan's group is, uh, application of machine learning and natural language processing to this technology and patent link. I've told you that we want to get hundreds of domains. It will take us a long time, and we really want to improve on the COM in a lot of ways. So this is very important to us. And I think it's going to work, whether we'll be the ones to do it or whether it will be other groups, doesn't matter. I, I think it's very important uh, uh, work to be done. And we also uh, have some work. It links technology and domain improvement directly to total factor productivity, which begins to link into economics. And in my discussions here over the last few weeks, I have been here for more than three weeks now, it's been great, but the discussions, this, I have a much broader view of how to get into this now by connecting into some of the work going on in, uh, at, at INET. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm uh, I have, but both of these things could end up linking to hear. Uh, also, what's possible for a larger scale practical application? And, and, before, and, and as I turn to that, I also will then, how, how might the work progress beyond this what and when? In other words, if it happens, what's that going to mean to society? That's the next uh, when, uh, next, next question. So possible larger scale practical applications. Uh, Matt Ives and I are discussing, and we're going to have another discussion Friday about trying to do uh, some analysis in the post-carbon world, and how do we get there? And, and, and can we do a complete analysis of all the possible technologies that, uh, and including in each technology, its improvement rate, and maybe a bigger model. I see Matt back there. Yeah. Um, we'll see where we get on this, but it's one of the things that I'm excited about trying to do. And I also think we can go further in environmental technology in the post-carbon world. I think the whole planetary boundaries kind of work that's gone on is a much bigger systematic approach to looking at the climate effects, species reduction, ocean nitrogen, et cetera. It, that, that's a very important piece of work. And I don't know anybody that's been looking at the patent system base analysis of what's being done and what's being neglected. And, uh, and I think that would be a, a very useful thing to do. And then what the scientific publications about environmental issues indicate. And if we do have a way of predicting new domain emergence, maybe we go through that. So 
And another important health, large-scale project involves healthcare technologies, and, and Francois and I have been talking about that. We are going to take the next couple steps. Uh, we'll see if it goes any further. But but the point is, if we can get rates of improvement all over the healthcare world and combine this with some mortality rate changes and a model really for life, we might be able to begin to put kind of probabilities together for when there could be such things as, as uh, radical life extension. And, 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 and it, it's kind of another exciting. So I, I got a lot out of my uh, 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 Oxford stuff, as you can see, and, and, and the broader elements of technology forecasting. First of all, environmental prediction, impact prediction of individual non-environmental technologies must involve prediction of human adaption and evolution of use. In other words, how much is going to be used? And the talk I actually gave here last year at least gave a, a, a good high-level model of that based on um, based on elasticities, which aren't very measured, but they must. But I think there's more can be done, and I also think that, that psychological research and impact on individual humans and groups on interacting humans. Uh, some people say that's impossible, but then I say, well. How do these companies, which get us addicted to their technology, do it? They're doing it. Uh, you mean the, the science world can't try to do it in terms of making some more prediction, more fundamental work? I don't agree. But And then I'd like to see a cross-disciplinary group evaluating the human and societal impact of things like extreme life extension. That could come out of what, what I talked about earlier. So uh, as a summary, uh, I just highlight that last line. Uh, because that's, that's the longer range future of where I'd go. And it'll include economics as a key part of it, which comes from some of these earlier pieces uh, in here, and maybe from these large scale practical. So when you put it all together, we'll be actually trying, I'll be trying to get to uh, that kind of view. Thank you. Hello. Well, you use the uh, the rate of change of performance as a key metric, and then when you talked about uh, battery electric vehicles, etc., you combined it with other things as well, right? right? But there might be other complicating factors as well, isn't it? I mean, for example, the environmental impacts. Let's take battery electric vehicles, for instance. Right. I mean, if uh, the electricity generation and the power Right. You know, is not clean and green. As the numbers increase, right. those problems will very become very big, and so that would also determine how fast. The... No, I, and I, and what you're pointing to is what I think of as a systems analysis, and I and, and again, Matt and I are going to be discussing these kinds of things. But you know, battery electric vehicles won't by itself unless you get uh, the electrical system carbon-free than battery. In fact, there are places that putting cars on the batteries is actually negative for carbon, uh, as you know better than me. But, 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 but so you can't do it just by pieces. So we'll need a, a systems analysis of it as well as a, uh, what I've pointed here is how to do some of the elements. But the systems, that's sort of what I like to do anyhow. But, but, uh, but I think you're right. Uh, you can't just sort of take these out one at a time. And that's the same, I, I should say, even with something as striking as the electroceutical result. You know, it could be that electroceuticals and pharmaceuticals work together in some complementary way, which would change the kind of words I said here, uh, which kept it simple. Uh, because you, you do have, it's a more complicated system for any of them, and medical will be one of the, uh, you know, how far we'll be able to get in our efforts will be limited somewhat by being able to see all those functional interactions. Uh, and by the way, I, that third one, or second one there, machine learning, I mean, I have high herps that we'll be able to pull more and more of the functional interactions and so forth, but, but I'm, I'm having enough reality here to say I'm not sure how far I'll get in any of it, but, but that, that could be longer term again. It could be a... a, a possible answer to But, I, but I, I should also say that I don't see these re techniques that I've talked about replacing good thinking, OK? 
it's, 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 a, it's a supplement. It puts some quantitative pieces in place that I think are helpful. But if I were a CEO of pharmaceutical company, I wouldn't just make my mind up on the numbers here. Uh, but, but I might want to know these numbers. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Um, I guess my question is about uh, sort of the role of policymakers um, and, then, and then also the role of, of uh, finance as an industry and the agency that they have um, in, in sort of helping new technologies emerge. Where, do, where does that fit into the framework? Yeah, um, policymakers is a, is a good, very, well, two different questions, I think. Although I guess they're linked, that's why you asked them the way you did. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, one of the things that I would like to be able to see is try different policies in a model um, that includes some of this technology stuff. Um, and my, my guesstimate, though, is we would, you know, we, would, we would come back to what economists have said, even with simpler models, a carbon tax for carbon, taxes on what is bad. I said that in my talk last year, and I'll repeat it. But the tax what's not really good for us is a as a planet, as a people, and, and, and tax it enough. Yeah, then there's distribution problems. Well, you know, we, we got to deal with the distribution problems anyhow. That, that worrying about not solving environmental problems because we think we'll hurt the lower. You can fix that problem. You can have you know, non-distributive effects out of it. Uh, so I, I think that's the policy question. Now, the financial question, I think they follow the, where the money is. So if you don't have the right incentives, they're going to go to the wrong place, in my view. And that's, that's nothing surprising, right? Uh, so you need the right incentives. And to me, the right incentives is tax the uh, worst stuff. Uh, yeah, there's other things. You can, and the other thing you should do, I mean, we do it already, but right now in the crazy US, we're thinking about not doing it. But you know, you got to support the R&D. Research and the fundamental research is extremely important globally. Uh, it's extremely important. You've got to support that. And I guess R and D uh, uh, write-offs on taxes is, is probably makes sense uh, for companies. Uh, you know, so that, those are where I am on a policy basis. This, that almost sounds hands-off compared to most people, but but my view is that's probably their best answer for us. Uh, Thank you very much for your talk. It was quite interesting. Uh, and you just mentioned about the distribution problem. Uh, let me bring in the, the, uh, the literature of inequality. The slide which you showed uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding the technology change per year and which technology change at what pace, uh, is there anything, any relationship that the technology which matters to most, for instance, electric motor, electric motor would matter to large number of population who are in farming or agriculture sector? Uh, these technologies are changing at slower pace, and technology which where the money lies, where the, the, where the maximum incentives exist, those are changing at the higher pace. Is, is there any kind of relationship? If it is so, then uh, what what can we do to to uh, change that scenario? Yeah, I, um, I only half got your question. That's partly because I was trying to think of an answer, and uh, and and uh, it. it I think let me let me try to rephrase the question first, and that that is that I think you were uh, wondering if some of these differences in, in rates of improvement could cause inequality, uh, um, but I'm not sure that's what you asked. But but let me just say, I think my answer on inequality in technology is you need that in a good model with all everything else in it, and then run it and see. Okay, because I'm I, I don't. There's a lot of people speculating it's because technological change is accelerating. Or, and it's accelerating in a sense, but not in a relative sense. It's, it's more like constant percentage improvements. But it gets harder. And there, there are all sorts of distributional things between regions. Uh, Oxford, uh, you know, everything's home prices are expensive, right? Everybody lives here. Uh, and in other places, it's not. And that's, that's distribution within the, within the United Kingdom. And similar things, the coasts in the US have done better than the center. I don't think that's, that's mostly about technological 
Um, you know, I, I, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm uh, because there was a time when uh, Western Ohio and Michigan was the highest innovation, highest density of patents. The Wright brothers weren't the only people in Dayton, Ohio, that were inventing things at that time. Uh, uh, very important stuff. So, so some of it's that, but but I don't think that's that's all important uh, regionally. But that can max that can level out over time by people moving or whatever. I don't think technology by itself, or even improve, improve to, well, I don't know, but, but, but because we do have a fairly large R&D class now, we don't consider ourselves elite, but, but there is uh, part of the reasons that prices are high in Oxford is that there's a lot of R&D here. Uh, and and there, the same thing on the coast, I think, of the US. It's, it's, so maybe the doing of it is also, I don't know the answer. question, and I think we should probably quit. Uh, so what you've told us is very much about using statistical methods, you know, patterns we see in patents or past rates of change and extrapolations to try and predict the future. But maybe you could comment, Chris, on what you see as hope for more fundamental explanations. I know that you've, you've also written a lot about, well, this is improving fast because it's a printing process and Printing processes are scalable in a special way. Information technologies improve faster than material technologies. So that kind of thing. I guess I'd like both, maybe you can make a few broad comments about what we know, but also comment on what we don't know and what we might hope to know. Yeah, uh, OK, that's a, that's a good question, because I did not put in any of the model stuff. Uh, and my, the model that uh, Sabarna Bastin and I have published uh, really says there's two fundamental controllers of a given domain, and that is the interaction term, the complexity that, that James McNary and you published, I don't know, seven years ago, I guess, um, and, and scaling, okay? And, and the interaction term, we did a separate study, and I'd say it gives, it, it, it gave the right dependence, and it's statistically significant, but you know, we did it by a word search from patents, and you know, and it, you know, I think it was a decent support for that. There's no support for the other one yet uh, of the scaling. I mean, except you can see it would work the way we put it out. It it could explain everything. So I would say we're in the early stages of even having a theory that accounts for the, the differences. Um, but I think modularity is clearly part of it. Or lack of complexity, however you want to talk about interactions. Um, and therefore, you can think about it. Now, the next step, I mean, to me, or the simultaneous step is, OK, what do we do to change it? And let's say we're, we're interested in reducing environmental harm due to such and such, and we need this function and that function. And, and the current approaches are 3 and 4% stuff. Uh, and I mean, I think you need a new approach, okay, but, but so then what do you look for an approach? Can you now design approaches knowing what should work? Can you design low interactions in a, in a, in a set of devices? Can you, and since we don't even have a good model for scaling, can you design? Uh, I would love to have those models better and be thinking about the design, which would be much more proactive, much more fundamental, uh, not just accepting that what exists and what emerges out of science is enough. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm a little careful here because I think uh, the policy question made me careful too because we tend to think, humans, that we're the center and we can control whatever we want. And, and, I, and, I, and I just, we've been wrong about that so many times that I'm, that I'm I'm uh, a little slow to say that we will change them. I'm not, but I love to th keep thinking about it because we do learn. But it, but just think of oh, if we would just go do this simple thing, which is usually what we do in policy, especially if it has other good things like gets votes in some way. We'll, we'll have ethyl, you know, ethyl, ethylene ba based on corn. What a disaster! But anyhow, you know, but we have it uh, because somebody thought it was the right thing to do, and now you can't get out of it. Uh, and, and so we, we, we aren't good at that kind of choice. And so I'm slow by saying, but, but yeah, I think this is where 
the fundamental side has to move to. We get drinks somewhere? <laughs> Do we get drinks somewhere? 